We chose a movie based on a play. So it's always very care- you have to be very careful when you're making a movie like this that the final piece doesn't end up very very talky. I mean, we knew there would be a claustrophobic sense to this play because we had this like insular world and that was part of the effect. But at the same time, we didn't want to make it look like a play that just happened to have cameras shooting it. We didn't want to kind of do in the company of men, turn the camera on, let the actors go, and just kind of pray. It worked for that movie. We knew we had great words. We knew we had a great script. We had great actors, but we also know what we love about film, and we knew we could do more. Uh, on a very limited budget, uh, Susan Kipe, our production designer, worked with the location departments and got a lot of really cool locations, like Cadillac Jacks. And you know, we painted the inside and outside of that place, you know, twice, uh, so that we could basically give the movie a feel and a look. And there are a lot of other places where the setting actually kind of affects where you are, like when Benno's walking to the gym. Uh, where he's walking in this industrial zone, you see that the setting and the location can be a huge part of your storytelling. One of the things we did on the reshoot was we went and did the scene in the gym. Now, the gym does a lot of stuff. It's like going back to his past. It's kind of this trip down memory lane. And because we've set up that he's a boxer, that he used to do this, that Killian's kind of this like secret dark side of his past, just being in that physical location all of a sudden has meaning. Killian. So without just words, you're using setting and location and visual ways of telling part of your story. They become characters too. A lot of times, one of the most powerful tools you have are like props, little things that actors have in their hands. There's a shot at the beginning of the movie that we debated for so long. It's the first shot after the credit sequence where Benno's walking out into the party and he throws a cigar in the pot. And we're thinking to ourselves, well, that doesn't make any sense, man. This is his home. He loves his place. He keeps it neat and orderly. I mean, this is his, this is his world. There was no way he would do that. We would do that. But then as we really thought about it, we realized, wow, this is like this great tell. This is like a 40 inch slip. He's showing that even though he has this home and this family and everything looks kind of peachy keen, it's this little hint that something's amiss, that the fertile seeds of destruction are kind of always there with that character, that even though everything seems so pleasant, he could destroy his whole world. And like you see in this scene where uh, producer Eric comes in and he pushes the thing in with him. After he's done, after Eric leaves, after the big boy leaves and leaves the money, you see him fixing the place. He's trying to kind of create order and put things back together. And a lot of times these little touches, attention to detail or props, can turn what could be a talking head's nightmare into what it should be, a movie. You know, the very first draft of the script, it read a little bit like a play, where, you know, there's a lot of long scenes and talking. And what we pushed David to do is said, you know, at least find some business for the actors to do. And in that scene where Benno's telling Scotty everything's going to be okay, the diner's going to be fine, notice what's he doing. He's fixing the coffee maker. And it's like he might be saying that the world's fine, but really his world's falling apart and he's kind of helpless to do it. And look, look at him when he's on his knees after he's gotten the money. When Krista walks in, he's trying to fix something. And when Joe comes in to buy the diner, Kurtwood's cool and he's smug, but what's he doing? He's trying to fix something. Another example is look at the way the jacket plays off. The jacket, he steals it at first. It shows that he's thinking about kind of going back to his old ways. But then later on, look at this scene. You going to wear that jacket? Kurtwood calls him on it. He uses the jacket as an example of saying, you're not ready to talk to Killian. You're not a good con. You're you're a young punk. You're going to get in trouble. And then, which sets up later, when Killian asks if he can, where's his jacket? It's a funny little joke. It's a payoff. It's a through line. You see my jacket. You see a lot of this in this movie. But basically, by repeating things and letting things run through as motifs, you can create cumulative power and meaning by, by repetition. So you see all these little visual things you know, add up together and kind of create power. It's nice. You know, the words might say one thing, but in a film, the images are really what it's about, and they can be saying something else. (laughs) Pretty cool, huh? But even if you're making a low-budget movie, think about how the visuals can impact your movie, how props, how setting, how location, how even costume design can affect the story and be part of what you're doing. Because although, you know, we had a great screenplay, ultimately we're making a movie, and movies move. Make it visual.